I'm excited to be joined by a very special guest. It is the one and only Peter Burns. PB, so nice of you to be able to take some time away from the golf course to be with us here today. Appreciate you doing that, man. Um, I played earlier today and it was just horrible. I played actually good on vacation. I ended up shooting 68 at one round and I'm like, man, I can't wait to play. And like, there's like, there's a certain thing in golf. Like there's an equation. The more you look forward to a round of golf, by far the crappier you're going to play. So like, I couldn't even get to bed last night. I'm like, all right, did I, you know, I can't wait to play tomorrow. The weather's going to be good. Then I played horrible. So, um, that's just the way it is, but you know, life goes on a little bit, right? Have you thought about what the hole in one reaction is going to be, or just you're not going to cross that bridge until you actually have to come to it? I actually lipped out today and I was like, I don't even know, like I need to start thinking about it, practicing it. All I know is that the fact that McElroy has one and I don't, and then Nate Oates has one and he doesn't even play golf. Like it triggers me a little bit. And then I was playing golf with my dad about, um, about I don't know, maybe a month ago. And he's played since he was 20 years old. He's 71 now. And right in front of me on the eighth hole over at our course in Charlotte, he ends up making a hole in one. And I think I was more excited for him (laughs) than, than, than myself. I was like, I was super pumped for him because I'm like, all right. I got, I got a couple more decades to try to get mine. He finally got his. So you'll get there eventually. I I feel very, very confident. It's going to happen. You're going to be able to rub rub it in McElroy's face so much. Like that moment for you is just, like 2019 LSU national championship to type levels for, for you in terms of like personal satisfaction. I'm going to be the most annoying person. Cause I'll probably post it 30 times and not <laughs> one person. Like nobody cares what you shot in golf. Nobody cares like your fantasy football team. Nobody cares about like your poker bad beats. Like these are all the conversations that people have. They're like, I'm listening to you, but I give zero F's about any of it. So I, I get it. It's totally self-serving, but sooner or later I'll get one of those. So. Let's play a game. I say you get exactly one of these for the rest of your life and the other you get none of. So mm. to quote Caddyshack, which is one of the most overrated movies of all time, um, you'll get nothing and like it. That's that's the okay. approach. Um, yeah. Okay, so you get one hole in one or you get one more national title. No more, Ooh. no more than that, but you get nothing of the other thing. Um here's the deal like so is it is it football or is it baseball or can i pick the national championship because i'm trying to see because i'm still giddy over 2019 as an lsu fan that i'm like i'm okay for a little bit right like there wasn't some 40 year old itch that i needed to scratch like the georgia bulldogs or a&m that's trying to you know win one in this modern era um it would mean a lot for baseball because i grew up such a big lsu baseball fan and now jay johnson's there but damn, I don't have a hole in one. So this is like a total selfish thing. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to say I'll take the LSU baseball championship because I'm betting on myself that I'll finally get the hole in one. And if not, then it's at least something I can at least attain. So I'm betting on myself that I can get the hole in one, but give me an LSU baseball championship or at least give me two weekend starters right now. Because I think LSU bats are incredible so far. But I'm not. I'm. I'm a little worried about their pitching so far this year. Early in the, uh, you know, the first big week of the uh, of, of the season, Connor. <laughs> on the on the football side, are we about to see Miles Brennan finally play a full season at LSU? Is it happening? I mean, I hope it was kind of a freak deal. I mean, even the first time he got injured, and then second time, of course, I think it was at the fishing camp and just kind of a freak accident. Um, you know, I hope. I mean, you know, I mean, he's been there since like 1997. Mm-hmm. I think he was there like behind Jamarcus Russell, if I'm not mistaken, on that yeah. chart. Um, so I'm, I listen. I, I was happy because I knew whenever I know a lot of people that wanted to go after Keishawn Butte, and like they were like, "All right, guys are transferring out. Um, what's going to happen?" I think the fact that Miles was there, Keishawn stays. That you know, people are happy. There was news today that John Emery is going to be eligible this year. Remember, there was kind of a, yep. a weird scheduling quirk last year because of his school schedule and COVID. He wasn't able to play. So, I mean, that's, that's a good thing. But um, I'd like to see it. I mean, you know, we've never really seen Miles get a full season, you know, underneath his belt. And I, I'm kind of curious what this offense is going to, to look like. I, I don't expect LSU to be a 10-11 win season type team. But my first thoughts, I'm like, all right, if you can go nine and three this year and kind of like everything settles in, you know, start creating a little bit more of consistency around this program, then you then you can build it right now. I mean, listen, I I said it at the beginning of last season, like last January, I was like, all right, 
it's Georgia's year. They're going to win the national title and call your shot in January. And they ultimately won it. Not that that was a big, you know, out of left field pick, but I'm, I'm that way with Alabama this year. I mean, as good as, you know, Will, as long as you got Will Anderson and Bryce Young, I can't imagine they're going to miss any whatsoever. So, I mean, it feels like it's Alabama's year. And the only thing is LSU fans and all, like all college football fans can hope that Nick Saban's totally done with name, image, and likeness and all these other rules mm. changes that he's like, you know what? I've done it. I've done it all. I've set all the records. I'm just going to walk away and go play a bunch of golf. I doubt that's going to happen. But, you know, every other college football fan base is like, Come on, Nick. Maybe maybe it's time to stop dealing with all these uh, you know these these crazy transfer portal rules and stuff like that. So um, who knows? The chaos that that would bring to college football would be nuts if that happened. Yeah, you have to sell yourself if you're an SEC West team fan on not this year. Like that that's that's where I come back to. If you have these kind of like hey winner bust type expectations, no matter what situation you're in, you're probably looking at this all wrong, and you're just going to end up disappointed. With LSU, the year one floor is really interesting because I find mm-hmm. myself thinking maybe it's seven and five, maybe it's eight and four. We've seen some of these hires that have looked really good and even losing guys like Corey Raymond, Mickey Joseph, that's been well documented at LSU. But do you see this as a team that has maybe that seven and five floor or is this potentially like you were just talking about nine and three? Is that maybe the more realistic expectation for year one of Brian Kelly? Yeah, I mean, I, I would be disappointed with anything that's not nine and three, just simply because I think that should be traditionally the floor of LSU football. You have that good of talent each and every year, and you've got a quarterback who has a lot of experience or has been there for a long time. So it's not as if, all right, you got a Haynes King type situation like A and M had last year. Last year, and Calzada has to come in, and you're like, oh man, you know, this is not like Jarrett Lee at LSU coming in and not ready for the position. Uh, and everything gets thrown at them. So I think there's enough players. Plus, keep in mind, the last two years, they have played a ton of young guys over at LSU, right? I mean, it hasn't worked real well um, as much as we saw in 2019, but there's a lot of guys that 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 have played some quality snaps that there's no reason in my mind. I, I'd be disappointed. I sure as hell would be disappointed if it's seven and five. Um, you know, I mean, eight and four, I guess, is kind of the middle ground, but give me give me nine and three in year one, I'll be all right. How sick will LSU fans be if Billy Napier becomes to Florida what Kirby was to Georgia? <laughs> you know, that's interesting because he's right down the road. I, I don't even I don't think LSU fans are gonna think about that, right? Like I don't I, I don't think LSU fans look at, you know, it'd been one thing of like if Tom Herman went to Texas and all of a sudden he became this unbelievable just God out in Austin and it worked real well. I think LSU fans will look at it and go, man, like we could have had Tom Herman had we pushed, you know, and in, in, in that deal. And I don't think it would have happened. I think Herman was using LSU as leverage the entire time. Yep. But I think then people would be looking at it like, well, man, we could have had that guy. I, I don't think LSU fans ever really thought, hey, Billy Napier's our guy. Why don't why aren't we kicking the tires? Because they always felt like, man, if, if Scott Woodward, after what he did with Kim Mulkey, after the hiring of Jay Johnson, it's like go big or go home. And then you end up hiring Brian Kelly. I, 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 don't, I don't know if they'll be that big of a we're watching over there. It sure as hell is going to be interesting, too, for as long as we have, you know, this, this annual LSU-Florida rivalry, just to kind of see both of these programs put new head coaches at the same time. They'll meet each other every year, at least for a while, until the schedules change. That's going to be that litmus test every year of, like, who's recruiting better. And I'm, I'm hoping. I mean – I, I, listen, the SEC West is a, you know how it is, Connor. It's a murderer's row. Like, yeah. I'd like to see that in the SEC East as well. And we need Florida to step up. We need Tennessee to step up. We need Kentucky to still have those big seasons if they're going to compete with, you know, the thousand pound gorilla, which is Georgia football right now. I want to uh, ask a couple of basketball related questions here before I let you on your way. Um, I, I think that looking at the SEC right now, it feels like it's been all over the place with certain teams, but heading into the home stretch here, it feels like there's four teams who can win the conference tournament, make it to the second week of the NCAA tournament and uh, Auburn, Kentucky, Arkansas, Tennessee, and then everyone else is just wildly inconsistent game to game (laughs) all over the place. No idea what to expect. Home road doesn't really matter. And that's not really a bold take, but how do you see the league playing out with kind of that all in front of everybody? Well, listen, I I think the league is in maybe as good of a shape as it's ever been, right? And there's only what you look at 
you know, Georgia and Missouri that have really kind of struggled. But outside of that, I kind of feel like even like South Carolina, you catch them on a bad night and, and they'll outmuscle you and, and they can play with anybody. Um, to me, what I like about where the SEC is at right now is I can't remember the last time, if ever, we've had two legit chances to get number one seeds, right, between sure. Auburn and Kentucky. So I feel like it's an absolute chaos if neither one of those teams make the Sweet 16. The difference is with the other teams is that normally you would have like a seven and eight seed, maybe a nine seed that kind of gets in where Florida is at right now. You've got a bunch of teams that are baked in to be like three, four, five. Right. And I, I think I love that. You know, I can see Arkansas catching fire, which they have lately. I mean, Tennessee's always a really disciplined team. Alabama, how you catch them like LSU and Alabama would strike fear in me if all of a sudden they come in as like an eight seed and they got to play or nine seed and they got to play like a one, one or two. Yeah. Right. I mean, because I'm thinking, I'm like, if you get Xavier Pinson healthy and all of a sudden you get a bad matchup and you can't, you know, you're having a bad shooting night and LSU just runs you out of the gym just defensively in their transition. And then what about Alabama? Like, I like the teams that are in that kind of mid tier for the SEC. I feel like LSU, Bama, I, I put even Arkansas to that point. It's like, hey, if they catch fire on any given night, like you're done. Like, you just, you know, it's like NBA Jam or like, remember when you play, uh, what was it, Tecmo Bowl? and you'd guess the right play and you had no chance, like that's, that's what it could be. And I could also see them all flaming out in the first round as well, too. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I, I said it yesterday on Twitter and I get it. I'm an SEC apologist, but I'm like, you look at what happened just now in football. You look at where we're at in basketball. Like we just talked about women's hoops is going to have nine teams in and the number one team in the country, baseball and softball. You've got track, you've got five teams in the top 10 in gymnastics right now. I'm like, Dude, like, is this is this the golden age of SEC sports? Have we, have we ever had it this good as far as this many teams that could compete for a title and the depth, the interest? And, oh, by the way, Texas and Oklahoma are in the wings just like, hey, put me in coach as well, too. Like, I don't know if at any point since this conference has been created that the athletic programs are in a stronger position of power than they've ever been. Somewhere, Danny Cannell just dry heaved big time. <laughs> big no, because even time. Danny, even Danny knows it. That's the beauty part about Danny, and Danny's great. Like he pretends to be upset about it, but he'll acknowledge it because he is sharp. He just knows how to needle people properly. I, I talked to Danny a decent about the national championship, and yes, he very much knows it. There's no doubt about it. Like he's he's well aware of what he's doing. Um, last basketball question for you: Have you been to any SEC games this year? Or have you been kind of locked into the the studio thing? Yeah, that's what that's the only thing like I got the absolute flipping dream job, right? Somebody was asking me like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I want to die in this job. Like I want to be in this job until I'm 72. And they're telling me to get the hell off the set, right? Literally um, die in studio. Like that's literally, like that would probably be, you know, <laughs> well, maybe that's a little bit far. But um, the, the situation is right now um, is I can't really ever go to the game you know, because I'll, I'll work and I'm in studio. So I get so jealous when I talk to Andrea Carter or, you know, Alyssa Lang or some of our other uh, people and Marty Smith who are there because they get to see what it's like, right? Like when Florida rushes the court, which is still kind of crazy. I don't think Florida should ever rush the court, but it's a different story. I was there. Um, it was, it was yeah, pretty um, weak. Yeah, I mean, but just Katie George, my ESPN co-host, she was there in Fayetteville when Arkansas beat Texas mm -hmm. in football. And I'm like, I want to experience that, but that's, that's the only thing about my, uh, my dream job is that I can't actually go to the games unless it's like SEC championship. So I'll, um, that's okay. I still get to go to Omaha and SEC baseball tournament. Um, so I'll, I'll be okay with those things. So. That's true. I mean, you're, you're a jet setter. I mean, we kind of casually ran into each other at a Cubs Rockies game in Denver this past summer, which I mean, PB you're everywhere. Like you're all over the place, even though you are in studio. So I'm sure, you know, I'll, I'll run into you probably when I'm in Utah or something like that this summer. So nobody. No, that'll be Chris Doring, like Doring, true. Doring on our Sirius XM show daily. He's missed like 43 shows mostly because he was like the flights he's like oh the flights out of tulum mexico <laughs> weren't me. working or i couldn't get home from puerto rico or newport beach i was at the white party in the hamptons i'm like when i grow up i want to be chris doring uh to a certain extent i'll put it that way <laughs>
Uh, at least have his abs. That's that's the goal. That's what everybody Dude, wants. No kidding. My gosh, ridiculous. He looks like one of the, you know those old men in the, like the eugenics commercials or whatever. He's like seventy nine years old. And he's got a oh, yeah. six pack. That's going to be Doring whenever he gets older. Oh, so. that's that's him now. I mean, let's be honest. Like CD is sure. he's at that level. He's worth. How did we get to talk about Chris Doring's abs here on the I podcast? I feel weirdly uncomfortable and how how smooth of a uh, a transition it was as well too. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> Before I let you go, Players Tribune, uh, tell me what you're doing. You're, you're, uh, I know you're teaming up with our guy, uh, Aaron Murray, here, doing some cool stuff. And also, can you explain what an NFT is? Yeah, so so it's interesting. What's funny is, you know, uh, Aaron started doing this stuff called the Players Lounge. And what they did was they locked uh, Players Lounge, lounge. Yeah. yeah. I said Players yeah, Tribune. No, no, play. I meant, yes, yeah, I was going right. to be like, man, that's where the Players Tribune is where you go and, and say, I'm taking my talent from somewhere else. But um <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a project that I've just kind of been more interested in anything. Like I always thought that like for NFTs, like sooner or later, um, you know, they're kind of these collectibles, but what they are is they're going to give you an opportunity. And what was brilliant about it is they set it up at Georgia going, Hey, when you collect these, you have an opportunity to win. And let's say that you get an NFT and it's got one that has sets embedded on with an autograph. Well, that's, you know, you get an opportunity to do that. And so I told him, I was like, well, if you're doing it at Georgia, why not do it at all college universe and universities right so you know they're going to be launching a bunch of different schools which they've talked about lsu being one of the next ones that's going to launch which is exciting so you know i look at the success that they had over at georgia and you know they did something like I'm almost saying like a almost a million dollars in those sales and they were able to go back to the student athletes for name image and likeness i'm like this is a really cool opportunity the student athletes can get involved in it for a, a way for them to make money an opportunity to have kind of a collectible um, so it, it, it's interesting. It's called Players Lounge. So look it up and do, and do the retail or research on it. And there was a great article that Christy Dosh put on that got me interested on it uh, over in Forbes that talked about how, man, this is kind of, you know, the future of maybe even ticketing about like all of a sudden, you know, Saturday Down South can have an NFT and then, you know, they do a thousand of them and, you know, four or five of them have, hey, here is, you know, it's got a little emblem that says VIP and you get to go to a VIP tailgate over at the, you know, SEC championship game. So yeah, I, I think it's kind of the future of what we're doing. And now the fact that student athletes can make some money off this thing, like, I don't know, Connor, I, I don't know about you, but I'm like college baseball. I think it could be huge. Like think about like Oscar Shibwe over at Kentucky, right? Oh, yeah. Like Kentucky is so much, so good right now. And he just got cleared to do name, image, and likeness deals. I'm like, is there a world where Shibwe is it like a top 25 or a lottery pick in the NBA, but he can make enough money at Kentucky to where it's like, man, I, I, I can go to school here another year. And Kentucky's a fan base with name, image, and likeness. I would imagine that could do pretty well for those student athletes. I mean, hell, Ty Ty Washington was what, driving a Porsche already. So I'm like, that's not a bad life to kind of work on your game. Like, is that a better lifestyle to be? I mean, what would you choose right now? Would you rather go G League or make a pretty decent amount of money and be a big man, literally big man on campus in Lexington around oh, one yeah. of the most storied programs? And now they're, they look like they're going to make a at least a, a pretty deep run in March this year. Yeah, Hendon Hooker is another great example of that. Yeah. Dude is killing it. Like, Tennessee hasn't had a quarterback. Like, a returning quarterback has been the man in forever, and he just gets to benefit off this for, for the next several months. Agree with you 100%. It is the, the future, and good to see you're doing great things with the Players' Lounge, not the Players' Tribune. We'll get it, we'll get it squared <laughs> away, man. It's cool, man. I, like, and what we did was, you know, we designed um, the, you know, the NFT logos and stuff like that, or the, the actual NFTs. And they have all these different traits. So, you know, like they have the Board 8 Yacht Club. That's one of the big NFTs. They all have these different traits. Like the ones at Georgia were awesome. And I told Aaron, I was like, that's nice. But we got to make sure that the LSU ones are, are even nicer. And Alabama's and stuff like that. It's, I, I got a feeling like it's kind of being like on the ground floor, something that's going to be big. And uh, hopefully as big as my uh, Upper Deck uh, King Griffey rookie cards from back in the day, man. Those are my favorite. Oh, the best, man. The absolute best. I'm a sucker for all things Griffey. Um, I literally I have. So in my in my closet at the house is I've got a, you know, I mean, it's a PSA rated nine. It's not like anything great, but it's the Upper Deck King Griffey Jr. card that I bought. And I'm like, it like brings me this stupid amount of joy every day when I get ready for the studio <laughs> stuff. It'll be like, there's Ken Griffey. Like, no reason. Like, Ken doesn't know. Ken Griffey Jr. doesn't know who the hell I am. Yeah, like, I've never met him, but just, like, looking at a stupid baseball card, like, brings me back to my childhood. I'm like, this is awesome. You're a kid. Kid at heart, as always, man.
41 or I, mean, I think I'm 42. I don't even know how old I am. I'm like that. I live in the dream, man. It's uh, it's fun. PB, you're the best, man. We'll talk soon.